Hi, this is Brad Keatley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 4th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We discuss our take on the governor's budget announcements last week and how those flow through to the 10-year plan. Second, we follow up on a weekend Newsminer article to explain why AKLNG, even if successful, won't result in, quote, massive revenues to the state, close quote. And third, we follow up on a recent commentary in the Alaska Beacon to explain that while some legislators are leaving the legislature, others are staying because they are continuing to find ways to spend on their pet projects. And now, let's join Michael. Let's talk a little bit about um, the weekly top three, which you've now had some chance, you've had a chance to digest the governor's budget. We had a little bit of analysis last week with Donna Ardwin. Uh, I thought that was some good stuff. Uh, but I know you've been working on some like 10-year projections and other things, and I've seen some of your charts, and you've got an article up in the landmine right now that's got a lot of this analysis. So give us your give us your, your hot take on what's going on here. Well, the budget's definitely up uh, this year over uh, uh, where we were uh, in the prior year uh, before we started in on the supplementals, before we had this last session. Uh, even with the vetoes, the governor's budget is about $5.6 billion dollars that's down from where the legislature had it uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the session. They were at about five point nine billion dollars. So the governor uh, uh, vetoed, and, and this is focuses on traditional uh, UGF, uh, traditional unrestricted general funds. Uh, the governor vetoed about three hundred million dollars out of that. But that's still that's five point six billion dollars compared with uh, four point six billion dollars uh, for FY twenty two. Uh, as enacted before we started in on uh, on supplementals, so about a, up a billion dollars uh, from the from the prior year. In in the in his press conference, the governor made the point that um, you can't really look at it that way, or you shouldn't look at it that way, because a lot of it's one time money, one time expenditures, and that uh, on a continuing basis, uh, budget looks better than. Uh, better better than it does if you look at it on the on just the the one-time basis of fy23 right and he's and he's correct about that to an extent we talk about that a lot in the uh in last friday's uh, uh article in the landmine where we talked to where we took those numbers took the governor's numbers and turned them into you know a, a revised and updated 10-year plan uh and the governor's right to some degree but there is some significant uh, continuing money. The operating budget, the agency budget, went up, for example, by about uh, five hundred million dollars, um, and that is a continuing, uh, uh, continuing. Uh, That's not a one-time expenditure. Is what you're right. saying, right? Right. It, it's going. It's going to show up. So we. So we. You know, read redone the numbers. We've looked at, at. As I said last week, when we were talking about this, what's really important to us is uh, what's the continuing. Uh, expenditure out of this. What's the effect on the long-term budget? Um, and it's significant. Where, where you know, the governor left it at about. We were at about four point uh, uh, six billion dollars or so at the end of FY twenty two. Uh, the governor, uh, as enacted or the as as the governor signed it, uh, FY twenty three is about uh, five point six billion dollars, so up about a billion dollars. 
when you take out the one-time money, we're at about uh, $4.8 billion or $4.9 billion rather um, uh, on an ongoing basis. So we're up significantly, about $300 million from, uh, from where we were uh, in, uh, in FY22. Uh, and, and, and the landmine article goes into this, but what's really important to understand is the impact that the higher inflation rates are starting to have, will start to have on the budget uh, going forward. And when you look at it uh, over time, uh, uh, we're going from about a $4.6 billion budget in, uh, in FY24 uh, up to about a $5.5 billion about budget by the time we get to FY32. And that's, that's really just the largely the effect of inflation uh, it's going to have affecting the, uh, uh, the agency budget. There are some changes that are going on in retirements. There's some changes that are going on in debt service. Um, and capital budget is whatever the capital budget is, whatever the legislature appropriates on any given year, any year is sort of a one-time expenditure. But the governor in, it previously had estimated about $150 million ongoing, $160 million ongoing capital budget. So assuming that, uh, you've got uh, you've got a, a significant uh, uh, growth uh, that's going on in the budget just from uh, just from uh, from from inflation. So I would say this: I would say that the governor didn't make matters worse, uh, much worse than what the legislature uh, had done uh, in the session. He brought it down some, uh, as you can see on the screen. He brought uh, the 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 enacted budget down some from where the left le legislature had uh, left it at uh, at adjournment, but he didn't. But he didn't bring it down enough. To, uh, to frankly uh, fit within revenues over the long term. Again, the landmine article goes into this, uh, but when you look at when you when you look even at current if, uh, current uh, uh, oil prices and and look at the futures market over the next ten years, we're still looking at deficits on on the governor's proposed POMB fifty fifty. We're still looking at deficits uh, starting back up in FY twenty seven and growing over the remainder uh, of the ten year period. So it, I, I would say that at the end of his four-year term, uh, at the end of this year four-year term, the governor has not made the situation worse from what the legislature has made it, but he's not made it better, uh, and he's not fit long-term. He's not fit spending, um, uh, state spending, uh, back into uh, long-term uh, sustainable revenues. Right. And so we're sort of we're sort of in a temporary situation where because of because of the the uh, run up in oil prices, we've got a balanced budget for a couple of years, or we've got a nearly balanced budget for a few years. We still have PFD cuts this year. We're still funding a portion of the, this year's budget from PFD cuts. Uh, but at POMB fifty fifty, at the governor's proposed POMB fifty fifty, uh, we slide back into deficits uh, in a fairly short period, fairly short term, and then the deficits start growing again. Let me uh, tell you what I see just immediately off of the, you know, uh, on this chart, one of the couple of the glaring things that I see that the governor didn't address. I mean, first of all, like you said, we got the $500 million, uh in operating supplemental, which means that was from the previous year going into last year's budget. I mean, in the literally this 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 was put in on the 28th of June. And the supplemental, I mean, the, the fiscal year ended on July 1 or July 30. So you had two days for them to figure out how to spend. I'm still scratching my head over that. And the $1.22 billion in forward funding. Why do you think he didn't address either one of those, in your opinion, looking at this? Well, the, the supplemental, the operating supplemental for FY22 contains uh, a couple of big items. One is the payback. Uh, for prior years, un the unfunded portion of the uh, school bond reimbursement. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's not a, an ongoing, it, it, it's not an FY22 expenditure in the sense that they had to spend all that money inside of two days. It, it is an appropriation in that year, using money in that year to pay back uh, the school uh, uh, school bond reimbursement. That's part of it. The other big part is a big contribution to the oil tax, uh, oil and gas tax credit fund, uh, the outstanding oil and gas tax credits that are owned still, they're owed still from the 20 teens, well, 20, 2000s and 20 teens, right. uh, oil and gas tax credit uh, uh, program. 
Um, and so a portion of the payback is in FY22 supplemental, a portion of the payback is in the FY23 uh, uh, statewide uh, statewide funds. So it's so so he's so he's I mean what he's what he's doing is he's trying to come even with local government on the on the school bond school bond tax credit uh and uh and and even that out and he's trying to trying to fill the uh the oil and gas tax uh, credit fund and he didn't uh legislature did that he didn't stop either of those forward funding uh forward funding is um so you've got to use less fund in some year. It's really a savings account and you've got to use less. You, you, you can get away with using less funds in some year because you've had this savings account you've set up in, in, in forward funding. The legislature should have used a portion of those funds to come even on the, U, on the, on the PFD. As you can see on that chart, you've got up the red on the lower right uh, is still the PFD cut uh from uh from this year that they're using this year to fund this right, year right. Le le the legislature should have used those funds uh in my opinion to fully fund the pfd i mean if you're going to come even if you're going to come even on on school bond reimbursement for the past and you're going to come even on the oil and gas tax credit fund why aren't you at least funding uh fy23 uh, uh the full fy23 statutory pfd but they didn't uh, they use those funds instead. To, they set aside those funds that otherwise could have been used for that. They set aside those funds for uh, FY for the uh, school bond reimbursement. And the governor, the governor wouldn't gain anything by vetoing the school. The, or, I'm sorry, the, the the forward funding for K through 12. The governor wouldn't gain anything by vetoing forward funding for for K through 12. He couldn't. Uh, he couldn't, uh, uh, for example, divert that money to the PFD. That's not within the governor's power. Right. So it's just it's going to savings and it will it will show up some year uh, by enabling the legislature and the governor to avoid to, to dodge having to fund uh, school uh, could, school funding. In, could he in have year. could he have directed that one point two two billion into the CBR? He could have. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that would have been. I think that would have been probably the best bet. He could have directed it there, and then they would have had again to have the three quarters vote to uh, to draw it back out. Um, but apparently, I, you know, all right, I don't want to spend too much. He, he, he did do he did do some of that. He did direct, for example, the legislature had appropriate had had set a or Bert essentially had set a a, a mechanism so that everything over one hundred and three dollars or one hundred and four dollar oil went to the permanent fund, went directly to the permanent fund. And the governor vetoed that and essentially redirected that money back into uh, back into the CBR. Uh, he also redirected some SBR money, some money that they tried to appropriate to the SBR uh, back into the CBR. So he did do some of that, but he could have done more with uh, right. <clears throat> with the one point two billion dollars in forward funding. All right. So grading on the budget is it what you about what you expected? Was it good? Was it bad? Give me a give me a grade thing here. It's a little bit worse. Um, I, I, I would have hoped looking forward, uh, looking at the 10 year plan, what, what the 10 year plan is once you, once you approve all this spending, I would have hoped the governor would have gone in and vetoed some more. I think, uh, I think Charlie, I think we'll hear from Charlie Pierce during the campaign, uh, about more that the governor could have done. Um, and, and I'm a little disappointed that he didn't set us up better, uh, over the next, uh, over the next 10 year, uh, cycle. I mean, I, the governor, I, as we've talked before, this is a poll ridden or poll driven, maybe a poll ridden also, but a poll driven administration. What the governor was trying to do was try to find the middle ground, I guess, between, you know, re-exciting everybody who in the recall Dunleavy effort who got excited about the vetoes he did last time uh, and and conservatives who expect him to be, you know, actually fiscally conservative. Um, and I guess he was trying to find the middle ground between those two. I would say that uh, I would say that he probably disappointed both sides. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the Walker and others, uh, you know, complained about whatever vetoes he had, whatever few vetoes he had. Um, and, you know, and I'm going to complain about the fact that he didn't set us up better for the, for the next 10 years. So yep. uh, it, it, it's, uh, nobody's happy. And I don't think it's a good, nobody's happy. You know, one right. of those things where, right. where you find, find the middle ground that way. Here's the thing, um, and I agree, David in the chat room says, when you disappoint both sides, your re-election chances aren't so good. The problem is, is that Dunleavy keeps trying to play, she tries to appease everybody. 
He's like walking down the middle of the road going, yeah, it's all great. And that's where you get hit by the bus. You know what I mean? Um, because he's afraid to take that stance. He doesn't want to reignite the recall Dunleavy campaign uh, people. Uh, but at the same time, he's, you know, irritating the people, the base that brought him in there when he said he was going to go in there and fix the budget. I mean, it's a very dangerous road to take, I think. It is. And and I, I'm i going to be interested to see how the how the campaigns play out between he and Charlie. I mean, because... Because the governor is is not the governor that we it's not the Mike Dunleavy we elected. I mean, the Mike Dunleavy we elected was bring the PFD back, you know, get get the state's fiscal house in order, stop using the PFD to to, to PFD cuts to pay for the budget, get spending down. Um, and that's not the Dunleavy. Or that's not the Mike Dunleavy we've gotten over the last four years. Um, and so it's going to it's going to be interesting to see if, you know, how Charlie erodes into into those who are concerned about uh, about uh, fiscal issues and, and concerned about you know bringing the state's uh, funding under under control uh, to to do what I would have wanted to to make the cuts necessary to set us up on the ten year plan uh, a sustainable long term budget uh, when you when you look out over the ten years to do that the governor would have had to make some significant cuts um, and that would have reignited the the you know the recall Dunleavy people but. You know, polls must be interesting. I mean, he's he's getting static from Walker and from Guerra and from others for the cuts he did make. Um, and so and, you know, and, and so K through 12 and the others are are upset with him anyway. So we'll, we'll see it. We'll see if he's uh, if he's if he's if staying this this course of staying in the fairway, uh, not not hitting big shots, but staying in the fairway, sort of right. using your 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 three iron or your four iron to go to just sort of piecemeal down the fairway we'll see if that's the that's the right strategy for the governor but right. it's not it's not achieving a, a long-term sustainable fiscal plan right which of course is a huge part of the problem and i think charlie's got a i think charlie's got a good he, you know charlie has really seemed to have been invigorating that base that voted for dunleavy that said look we need to bring the budgets back in line and we need to you know live within our means and be sustainable and charlie's done a good job with the kenai peninsula and he's got some track record on that kind of stuff as an administrator so i think he's got i mean i think he's got uh, uh you know kind of the the street cred so to speak uh to do it well although i have noticed that um i have noticed that the uh, establishment republicans have not really well, I mean, they've been kind of leaving Charlie out of a lot of the discussions and things like that. You can see some of the press releases and other things. They're not really mentioning him. Um, it seems like they keep trying to phrase it and put it between Dunleavy and Guerra and Walker and leaving Charlie even as number four kind of out in the cold. And I I mean, I don't know what to make of that. What What do you say? Well, they're trying to ignore him and hope it'll go away. I mean, I... We, we've talked enough. The establishment Republicans, the top twenty percent establishment Republicans, are, are are sort of satisfied with Dunleavy in the sense that you know as much as as much as Dunleavy likes to talk about the PFD, he's not really taking the 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 efforts it's ne that's necessary to to get the PFD reestablished. He hasn't gotten spending down, so we have to use the PFD uh, to supplement revenues to uh, to keep the state uh, keep the state budget balanced. So, you know, as much as they like to, as, as much as, you know, Dunleavy t likes to talk the game about being pro PFD and pro middle and lower income Alaska families, he's really a top 20% uh, uh, governor. And, and I think the, gov I think the establishment Republicans are fine with that. Um, and so, you know, if, if you, you, you don't want to give Charlie, you don't want to give anybody else a whole lot of credibility or a whole lot of airtime or a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of uh, 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 discussion. Uh, and try to freeze him out, try to, you know, ignore it and he'll make it go away. But it's interesting because I think Charlie's got some real grassroots support. I mean, and, you know, I mean, I've liked everything I've said. I've already said that I'm supporting Charlie um, uh, in this election cycle. I think he's, uh, I mean, I think he's the candidate uh, that we need um, because, you know, again, he's, he's, He's not only saying a lot of the things that Dunleavy said in his first campaign, he again has a track record that proves out that he is willing to do those things. He's willing to take the slings and arrows and uh, and, and to shrink the size of government, which, you know, heretofore, uh, you know, Dunleavy has been all talk and no walk. And uh, and that's a and that's I think that's resonating with people. 
Yeah, I, I, Dunleavy. Dunleavy has the pollsters. I mean, Dunleavy's trying to figure out how do you how do you sort of you know navigate through all this to uh, to to get to to reelection. Um, but in terms, it, it's navigation. It's not governing. I mean, right, right. Well, it, and it, go- governing by poll is never going to. We're gonna go. We're gonna get back here. Governing by poll is never going to work. That's. I mean, I think we can show. There's plenty of history to prove that. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about uh, number two. Uh, give me the give me the pitch here for number two before we go to break. Well, there's. We talked about the LNG project a few weeks ago, and and there was a surge of activity then about people saying, "Oh, we're far along with LNG." This was on the heels of a trip that the governor had made to uh, to Japan to push the uh, LNG project. Uh, we're seeing another surge of that now. There was a big article uh, in the Fairbanks News Miner over the weekend uh, uh, spinning off of uh, some comments by Dan Sullivan, Senator Dan Sullivan, and, uh, and a recent action by the uh, FERC uh, in releasing the draft uh, supplemental environmental impact statement of the Biden administration had required uh, for the project, and there's a whole lot of act, there's a whole lot of uh, discussion in the article, long article about uh, about the LNG project, including a subheading that says massive revenues for the state. If the Alaska LNG project is developed, it could uh, accelerate the state uh, state economy, and goes on to talk about some comment that there could be massive revenues for the state. None of that's true. Uh, and, I, and I sort of want to go back through this to sort of bring everybody back to reality about the, where the LNG project is. All right, welcome back to the program. Continuing now, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. It's the weekly top three. We're on to number two. We're going to see if we can race to number three. Number two is the Alaska LNG project, which according to the news miner promises to develop and deliver huge, huge revenues for the future, uh, to which Brad says, maybe not. Brad, what uh, what say you? Well, it's funny. I mean, I, I think we're going through an election push here, uh, election cycle push for uh, the LNG project. This may be Dan Sullivan, Senator Dan Sullivan's uh, uh, support for, uh, for Dunleavy, maybe his lane for supporting uh, Dunleavy. Um, the, the governor made a, a trip to uh, Japan uh, to push for the LNG project, got some good press out of that. Uh, the FERC last week issued a supplemental uh, environmental impact statement as required as the uh, Biden administration had required early in the early days of the Biden administration. The supplemental in- environmental impact statement uh, is positive in the sense that it didn't sink the project. Uh, it, it said some positive things. Dan Sullivan has now gone on, you know, a, a push uh, as a result of that, a push for the. Uh, uh, for the LNG project uh, that uh, that resonated at least with uh, with the Fairbanks News Miner uh, reporter, who dug into it and found some article that said uh, that uh, the uh, uh, the proposed Alaska LNG project quote will earn massive revenues for the state. It's also expected to generate between nine thousand and fifteen thousand jobs in the initial construction and design phase, and an initial one th- and an additional one thousand jobs. Uh, uh, during during operation, well, there's not going to be massive revenues. I hate to I hate to break, burst anybody's bubble. When you look at the long term LNG market, when you look at long term LNG prices, we're currently in a bubble, in a very high uh, bubble uh, uh, of LNG prices, natural gas worldwide natural gas prices. But you look at the futures market, and again, you got to look at the futures market where real people are putting real dollars, investing real dollars. In the expectation of where these prices are going, uh, the LNG mar- the LNG prices, natural gas prices, come back back down to about the seven dollar range within within the five year time frame, which is about the time frame that the Alaska LNG project will get going. There is an opportunity for the Alaska LNG project. Uh, it, it, we've talked about it before. It'd be a strategic somebody on the on the buy side, some customer on the buy side who wanted a secure supply of gas. We know the gas is up there um, and wanted it at a at a set price, uh, which Alaska could do. Couldn't happen in the lower 48, but Alaska could do because the gas is otherwise stranded. But it's not going to be a high price. At $7, uh, uh, we're going to get just a not much uh, out of the royalty and out of any uh, production taxes that might apply to the uh, to the upstream. Most of it will go toward reimbursing the cost of the of the pipeline that ha- would have to be built and reimbursing the cost of the 
uh, LNG uh, gasification facility that would have to be built uh, at Tidewater in Kenai. Um, there would be very little left over for, uh, for the upstream. So to think we're going to get massive revenues out of this is, uh, is, is just pie in the sky. And I think we're seeing uh, some electioneering by, uh, by some people who want to, you know, it, bolster up the Dunleavy administration who says, look, we're working on LNG. We've gotten it farther than we've ever gotten it before. Right. It's a go project. Look at what I'm doing for, well, it, it's not, but I, but, you know, there are those, there are people who want to, want to help out with the election campaign uh, uh, in that regard. So that's where we are. A big, as, as I say, for those folks in Fairbanks who saw the news miner article, a big buildup uh, again on the LNG project, but, uh, but don't believe it. Uh, we're not, we're not going to see massive revenues and we're, and we're going to be lucky to see the LNG project itself. And we're only going to see it if we see a strategic player out there who, uh, who, who's willing to pay a set price for uh, for a, a secure long term gas supply, which I mean, in the long term between with Russia and Ukraine and all that kind of stuff, that could be something that's attractive in the future because you know we're uncertain of uh, some of the geopolitical you know ramifications of some of these things. That that secure geopolitically stable gas pocket may be something that's attractive, but we just don't know at this point. Well, and and Michael, it's 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 two pronged, right? Secure gas supply. Uh, at a reasonable price, there, somebody's not going to come in and pay, you know, double or triple what what the market is telling us to expect uh, at uh, uh, for for that secure supply. They're going to pay a reasonable price, and what the futures market is telling us is the long term reasonable price is back in around the seven dollar range, which uh, will not leave much left over uh, in the upstream for right. either the producers or for uh, for the state. Okay. All right. Well, look at you. We made it through number two. Um, let's move on to number three, which is why are so many legislators bailing out? Why are why are they pulling the plug? Um, and we noticed again a full, you know, basically one third of the current legislators said, "Nope," <laughs> and either they're retiring or redistricting or everything else. But give us your take on this for number three. Why are so many legislators pulling the plug? Well, Sarah Erkman Ward uh, wrote what I think is a really nice, good column uh, in the Alaska Beacon, the new uh, the new uh, news website, uh, uh, nonprofit website, uh, and she wrote a, a commentary, an op-ed piece in the Alaska Be Beacon that's entitled um, uh, "Why Alaska Lawmakers Are Calling It Quits." What I wanted to focus on, what I want to focus on, is one of her reasons. She gives five reasons. And, uh, and I think it's worth, uh, worth listeners' time to go read that if you're interested. The fourth reason is the work is hard. And here's what she said. Back when the Senate was flush with seemingly, back when the state, rather, was flush with seemingly endless amounts of cash, legislators were able to spend their way to compromise, ensuring every district received its piece of the proverbial pie. Road and drainage projects, health centers, runways, docks, and other capital projects were divvied up to allow every lawmaker to bring home the bacon for their constituents, a ribbon a ribbon cutting could resolve a lot of differences. And, and then she goes on to say, and that's no longer, that's no longer occurring. The revenues aren't there any longer to have that. Um, and so legislators are having to, when you can't go home and have a ribbon cutting, legislators or are, uh, are not <laughs> as popular and, uh, and the work is not as easy. Well, she, sum not as she sums it up by saying, in other words, no one has been having fun for years now. I think that was, that was the classic comment in there. Yeah, it, but, but it's not universally true. I mean, to some degree, I focus on the big three of, of Click Bishop, uh, Bert Stedman, and Gary Stevens, right? I mean, and those guys are staying. They're not leaving. And what they found is the ability to continue to fund their projects on the back of PFD, PFD cuts, right? So they they found what to them is this sweet spot of we get to continue to have a capital budget, we get to continue to fund K through twelve, we get to continue to you know fund you know, swimming pool projects in in Sitka, we get continue to do all that because we have this deal with the Democrats that as long as we don't tax the upper income, as long as we don't tax the top 20%, they'll let us get away with PFD cuts to continue to fund these projects. So it's not universally true that that you're you're that you're giving up on all these on all this spending and all of the all of the accolades and all of the uh, comfort that comes from being able to spend 
those who want to spend in areas where the Democrats agree to the spending um, are are continuing uh, to spend. You know, it's it's in the old days you had Bill Stoltz, right, who loved to do things in the valley, loved to right. take all the excess oil money and do things in the valley. And so you've got, you know, you've got the Matsu uh, uh, College out there that's got you know a bunch of buildings. You've got a bunch of Bill Stoltz things that were built around. You're not able to do that anymore. But those who, but those who like Click and and Bert and and Stevens who find who who are able to who want to spend on things that that Democrats want to spend on because they are big employment, government employment, uh, government contract uh, projects. Those who want to spend on those are still doing it and still staying because they found this sweet spot of using PFD cuts to continue to fund their projects. I had a conversation with a uh, lawmaker from the interior, Democratic lawmaker, and asked him why, you know, and he's just like, uh, it's it's exhausting. The the back and forth, uh, even as somebody who I would consider to be fairly partisan and, and strong and strident in their positions, he was like, it's exhausting. This back and forth and these fights and the things and the, you know. I can imagine that this is, uh, like you said, when there's not all this money up for grabs, people are, it, it gets a lot more recalcitrant in there than, uh, than you'd expect. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of people and, and the notoriety, um, you know, somebody in the chat room mentioned beer pong and leg wrestling again. I mean, a lot of those legislators have pulled the plug because again, I just think that it's showing that, you know, you, you can't, you're in the spotlight and you're getting blamed for a lot of things. Some of it's your fault, some of it's not, but it's, it's a definitely a, a tough situation. We've got about a minute and a half here. But it's not, but, but my point is it's not universally true. You've got a core that are staying there because they found a way to continue to pay for their stuff on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. And as, and as long as, as long as, and, and so you've got a core that's continuing that's looking to continue to use that funding source uh, to pay for government. Now, Rob Myers got rid of one of those. He got rid of John Coghill, right, right, who was, who, who was one of those who uh, who who viewed uh, viewed government uh, uh, in that way. But we haven't gotten rid of all of them, and 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 there is a segment that is continuing to stay from election cycle to election cycle to election cycle because they found that sweet spot. As long as they stay there, and as long as you know those three Republicans sort of form the the balance of power in the Senate between the conservatives and the and the Democrats uh, we're going to continue to face uh, these sorts of these sorts right. of issues until we well, get, until we get them we'll see what if Elijah Verhagen has anything to say maybe click Bishop will have a run for his money this go around we'll see what happens the triumvirate that you just talked about which is Stedman Bishop and Stevens uh, you know Bishop has got I mean I think Elijah Verhagen has got a, a, a chance of uh, making some headway there and if they lose click, that's a that's a good knock on, and I understand Stevens has got a uh, a challenger out there. We'll see if uh, they can make any headway as well. Uh, she's uh, she's down there in the Kodiak area, I guess. Uh, forgotten her name right off the top of my head, but again, Stedman remains. Uh, Michael Sheldon is running against him, but I don't know. I mean, I would hope that people would support Sheldon, but I mean, I don't, he's kind of a perennial candidate, so I I don't know as that's necessarily a good sign. Um, but even if even if we're able to not click out, do you think that the two together, Stevens and Stedman, still have enough horsepower? Or what do you see with the? I mean, I, I can tell you right now, the reorg uh, on the Senate uh, may shove him out, uh, may shove uh, a Stedman out. But then again, we may end up with a bipartisan coalition. Then on, on that, what what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, Michael, you got you got to look at the Senate as a whole, right? And right. Senate as a whole is you got you got a core conservative group. You got a core progressive uh, group, and then you've got the middle that have sort of, you know, been in in power. You've got Natasha. You had Natasha. You had Bert. You had Click. Uh, you had Gary Stevens. Um, Checky, gosh, only knows where the heck he was at any given point in time. But you had sort of that middle group that was that was the balance of power, and they were able to use that 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 positioning to you know keep themselves in power. They could tell the conservative group, look, you want to be in the majority. We've got to be part of the majority for us to be part of the majority. You've got to give us the chairmanship, the co-chairmanship of Senate finance. Um, uh, and you and, and you know, you've got to you got to let us have our right. have our way. You can you can have all the other committees, but we've got to have we've got to have the co-chairmanship of finance. As long as they're in that position, uh, you we're going to have that. I mean, 
let, let's say let's say that uh, next time around the Republicans say no, nope, click you and and Bert, you can't be you can't be on finance, you can't be co-chairman of finance, you can't even be on finance. Well, all they're going to do is walk across the aisle and say, okay, Democrats, you want to be in power? <laughs> you, you want the committee chairmanship? Right, right, then, right. Then then here's our deal. So. It, you you you've got to the Senate has got to have enough conservatives that they can form the majority themselves uh, without relying on the three. And there's two ways to do that. One is to to, to elect you know conservatives another a, a conservative in the in in the keen eye to replace Michiki that's a hardcore conservative and and other steps like that to sort of solidify that block. But you've also got to you've also got to get it into a majority. And frankly, to get it into a majority, you've got it to beat at least one, if not two, uh, of the of the three. Right. If you don't do that, these guys are just gonna, you know, continue right. on, maybe as part of a bipartisan majority or maybe maybe as part of the Republican majority again, but they're gonna continue to hold that balance of power. Yeah, I mean, if uh, Tuckerman Babcock comes in and he's able to win his race there in the Kenai. That solidifies that seat. And then if, if Verhagen wins and knocks out Bishop, that's another. Uh, but you're right. I mean, we really you would need to see if you could take Stevens' seat, I think, the which is the more vulnerable of the two between Stevens and Stedman. You could have a chance of doing that. But people have got to get they've got to get motivated. They've got to get behind this next candidate and move in. You've got to count to 11. You've got to have 11 solid in your in your majority so you can organize the Senate. And you can name who the who the co-chairs of finance are. I, I've over the last ten years, I've become convinced that the co-chair of finance is the most important position in government. It's probably even more important from a from a fiscal standpoint. It's probably even more important than the governor, right? Because because the co-chair of finance controls what you do with the PFD. The governor can't override what goes on with the PFD in the legislature and you know, Bert's shown us time and time again, the co-chair of finance can, can manipulate things around to control what happens with the PFD. Right. So that is, that's the key. And the key to getting control of that position is 11 fiscal conservatives uh, in the Senate and, you know, and, and solidifying the Valley with Tuckerman is one of those, but you're, you're absolutely right. Getting Stevens or getting a uh, uh, click uh, is key to, uh, uh, solidifying that 11. Yeah, we also have Willie Keppel out in Quinnahawk uh, running against Lyman Hoffman. I would hope that maybe he'd get some traction because that would, again, would go towards that as well because Hoffman, Hoffman loves to uh, <laughs> he loves to, to play every side that he can to get what he wants. So uh, it would be he good. Will be, he, he will be in the majority. <laughs> Lyman yeah, will be he, part of the majority. One way or the other, the yeah. Is. Yeah, he'll, he'll be part of it. So it would be good to see uh, Willie go in there and Take that off the table because, again, that would count towards your 11. Um, maybe we can get some change. Now, I guess Louis Stutes has a challenger as well. Um, I haven't uh, heard much about them, so we'll see if we can get some info on that. But, you know, once we get the Senate squared away, you know, we still got the mess in the House going on. Of course, it's always been so close now. Kelly Merrick is running for Senate. Um, you know, she, I don't know if she's got much of a chance, but we'll see what happens there. Uh, but we'll watch to see what goes on in the House. I mean, we had 22 or something, 23 in the House, and it all fell apart. We could have done that. Now, if we can get both sides of the legislature together, we'll see. I think I think, I think, think in part the organization of the House depends upon the Senate. If you can get conservatives in the Senate, I think there's a greater a, a greater impetus to for the House Republicans uh, to come together. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. I it. It's all up in the air, but I. But the key, the key starting point, is can you get eleven core legislators, eleven core uh, Senate Republican senators, conservative uh, senators to uh, uh, to coalesce uh, over on the Senate side? Ke Kelly Merrick would be, you know, we. You, you go backwards one as opposed to going forward. Right, one. right, exactly. Well, Brad, that brings us up to the end of the hour. Thank you for coming on board. We appreciate it as always. Um, I'm I'm hoping that we could see some changes. This uh, this is going to be an exciting summer for the rest of us. So, thanks for being Mike, part of it, Michael. Thanks for having me as always, and I look forward to next week. All right, we'll dive into it. Thank you for being part of it with us, Brad. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. 
Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.